Yes, my name is Sue Ellen Chang, and I was the uh, executive director of the Chinese American Museum. And, uh, when the Chinese uh, community first established here, that was in 1860s and 1870s, by 1930s, this community has been pretty much uh, flourished, and you have uh, about 4,000 uh, Chinese Americans living in this area. Chinatown community was a very um, trying place in any way. So what they did is uh, they worked very hard. However, because of the uh, railway companies and the city decided to establish and build uh, the rail row uh, passengers terminals they are here and they have been looking all over town looking for places and nobody wants to have the stations uh, in their backyards and finally they found that uh, Chinatown sites that you know is the ideal place for them why because Chinese have been discriminated against for even where they should, you know, they can be living as well. My places. The first uh, building that was uh, torn down, that was a Chinese school. So um, subsequently Chinese have to find a place nearby, uh, which is uh, the Broadway uh, Chinatown today. The reason why is they were actually pretty much discriminated against. They could not go to the public swimming pools, they could not go to, you know, the beaches uh, that the, it's like it's restricted to, you know, a certain group of people. Um, they are, you know, uh, but the resilience of uh, you know, protecting themselves against all the discriminatory laws. And so in Chinatown, it's kind of a safe place for them. Uh, yes. Chinatown was a place that they could you know, truly do their business and you know, be happy. And then when they were uprooted, that was uh, traumatic uh, experiences for them, that they have to find new places and a lot of people probably, like I said earlier, they don't have the enough uh, financial backings. Uh, they have to find other solutions. Yeah, they, did, they were notified for sure. However, even if you are notified, if you don't have a lot of resources, so what the Chinese community's response is that they have to get together to figure out how they can do uh, the you know, plan for the future. So it took a lot of the planning, however, it was still very difficult. It's, again, it's uh, these uh, leaders, families that were able to get together, but there's still a lot of uh, small businesses, um, people who you know, have to look for other uh, places to go. We actually knew that the first building, as I say, Chinese uh, school, uh, was torn down in 1933, but then the Union Station was uh, completed in 1939. So in, since 1933, I think they have uh, some times that uh, while they are actually uh, torn, you know, tearing down the building, there's still a portion of it, you know, people gradually moving out, but it's, can you imagine their ears are, you know, um, construction start going, this demo, uh, demolition start going and then they have not found a place and then remember Chinatown was not completed and built in 1938 so it's just about a year before the Union Station completed so in between they have a lot of scrambling and uh, um, they living in a pretty chaotic uh, you know situation using the previous experience even though they didn't have uh, much voices but they try but we need to try harder today continuously because uh, uh, to Chinese uh, as well as the Latinos, even the African Americans, they were always in the disadvantageous uh, positions. 
And if you want to fight um, alone, usually you don't get as good as a uh, result as if you, you know, voice yourself uh, together. Uh, then your voice will be louder. Uh, I think we all need to join together. Um, I know the, you know, many of the times when we, you know, bundle together, <laughs> then your voice will be uh, heard. Uh, you know, Chinese has one saying that if you want to break one chopsticks, it's easier. But if you put a bundle of chopsticks together, you try to break it. Would you think it's harder? Right? So that is the analogy of how we should, you know, pull together all the voices. And I well, I was born in Los Angeles at the Good Samaritan Hospital. I've, I've been told, and I uh, lived in Boyle Heights, for, I don't know from when, but uh, up until the time that we had to move. We are for, forcibly removed from our homes to uh, camp. And that was, of course, uh, we arrived in Manzanar on April 2nd, 1942. successful businessman but he was arrested the night of December 7th on his doorstep and this is on Sunday night 1941 he was arrested by the FBI agents who were waiting at the door and and taken to federal prison camp federal prison I think first in San Pedro and then eventually to Missoula Montana and so um, and he was there for six months uh, he wasn't charged with any any crime or anything because he just was just a, a, a really nice person. Um, and so he uh, he was eventually released to Manzanar to the rest to the uh, rest of our family, and that was in June of 1942. So, but I'm thinking back now when she was 33, she went. That was the first time she went to camp. And imagine going into the latrine, the women's latrine, and you have a toilet there with no walls or doors. You have a shower that's out in the open. And you know, women, Japanese women, I don't know about you, but Japanese women were very modest. In fact, I am to this day modest. You know, I gotta make sure my, the door to my toilet is closed if I'm in the public. But this is like being in the public and having everything open. So I just think that that was an embarrassing and terrible time, the beginning. Eventually they built the walls and doors because people complain about not having any privacy. Like I said, it was just uh, you know being with your family. Um, for me, being with my family was important. and. Uh, they were my security. And even when we were standing uh, at the railroad yard with all these tracks and all these people waiting to board the train on April 2nd, and all these soldiers were uh, marching around with their uh, bayonets and their rifles, um, I asked my mother why we weren't at Union Station, why we had to be in this railroad yard. Never got an answer. Or other, they discovered that they were selling the rations on the black market, and so people got really upset over that, and they started to protest. And the protest turned was well, mostly young teenage boys and a little bit older, you know, the early 20s that uh, get sort of get together and and. Uh, talk among themselves and, and, uh, and uh, did the protests and then uh, the, they called in the military and there was maybe two, three hundred boys and men gathered at this one area when, and they called in fifteen hundred soldiers and with uh, tanks and jeeps and, and, uh, and it became a, 
a problem because uh, somebody moved a, a Jeep or something without, uh, or it just ran by itself, and then the uh, military started shooting. And uh, two people were shot and killed in, in that fiasco. And um, my uncle, uh, who was the head, he was the doctor who was head of the hospital, uh, had to do the autopsy on the boys. And um, he saw that the boys were shot from the back. But the administration wanted him to say that they were shot from the front, showing that they were attacking. And he refused to do that. And so, um, he was immediately relieved of his duties as hospital administrator and eventually sent to Topaz, Utah. Uh, one sure that we speak accurately in terms, of, in terms of referring to the camps that we were in. They were concentration camps and we were prisoners. But we don't always call ourselves prisoners because some people feel that that might be too harsh, but we were incarcerees, is the other word. We were not. If you had one sixteenth Japanese blood, you had to be in a camp. Babies were taken from orphanages, in Washington, Oregon, and California, if they were part Japanese, and put into an orphanage in Manzanar. Imagine, what is a baby gonna do you know, how much sabotage or spying can a baby do? That is how, how uh, stupid <laughs> and cruel the government was. This. We all have to do our job in making sure that something like this never happens again. That is the story that, the reason why I tell the story is that we make sure people are not targeted because of some uh, either ethnicity or religion or whatever and, and uh, rounded up and put into a camp and take their freedoms taken away. Lessons you learn to spread it to others so that something like what happened to us will not happen again. All right, thank you so much. LA, but I was born by the, where the Dodger Stadium is now. And I was probably there until about four years old. And then after that, uh, the Dodgers started knocking on the door and knocking all the houses down. Oh, but I moved down to uh, Solano Avenue right by uh, Chavez Ravine. Okay, and um, I have many, many memories. We used to play football, baseball, we did a lot of boxing. Um, a lot of the uh, big name boxing uh, uh, legends are from uh, Palo Verde and Solano. My father was at, uh, he fought in the Second World War, so uh, he was in the service. And uh, my, my mom, my mom raised us while my father was in the service. And uh, uh, from there we, here we are today. <laughs> when I was a kid, Padre Verde was a very poor community. Okay. Uh, then the Dodgers came in, in in the 50s and 60s and bought the place out. After that, I moved to Solano Avenue. They moved us all to Legion Park, Solano Avenue. That was down the hill. From there, I can remember everything that went on because I lived there for many, many years. I was about 
until about 12 years old when I moved out. Okay. Um, but uh, the the community itself was neat. They were we were all close together all the time. Okay. Uh, there was no. It was like a family. It was like a family oriented. Okay. It was just we all got along together. We all supported each other, and we all loved each other. But everybody followed to Solano. Okay, the, uh, um, the Legion Park down below. Everybody went down below. They placed us down there. Yeah. It was like a refuge uh, camp. I mean, you know, you know what? Uh, we're gonna take your place, so you're gonna go over here. Much closer then because everybody was was really sad because they took their property. I mean, how can you? You know, they and those days they just moved you out. It wasn't saying, we're going to buy you out. They moved you out, and they gave you whatever. Some people never got anything. It was when we left, we had one family left over by, by the um, by police academy. And uh, that was the last family, and they fought to leave. They fought the police, and the news media came, channels. 11, all, all the channels came to see them take my aunt out because my aunt didn't want to leave the place. Well, you know, in those days, it was very hard to um, express your feelings because really nobody really, really, really would hear you what, what, what happened. It's not, not, it's not like nowadays. Nowadays, they'll, they'll uh, you can get an attorney, you can get whatever. You can get uh, uh, news media. You can get somebody that will listen to you and and, and present it to the uh, uh, media. You got to get a journalist, and they'll they'll listen to you, and, and they'll make a big thing out of it. But before it was just a so what? It was a hush, and uh, you know we were Mexicans, so in those days, who cared? They used to carry your ass out quick. That's it. You know, you kids, um, you kids today have something that we never did have. Um, a, uh, speech that we could not ever really do before. Now you have freedom of speech. Best thing see you kids here okay when we were your age we couldn't do this and you're all Latinos I don't know if you guys remember uh, uh, Mr. Castro mm. okay he's my best friend very best friend. Um, he really raced me in Solano. Okay. And he's the one that taught us a lot too. Castro was good. He was a leader. He was the first one that started the walkouts. 
You heard of that? Okay. They were very good friend of mine. So Castro was one of my mentors. Okay, he was he was at Solano Avenue. He was at the school in the summers. Okay, and he was a very very good mentor. And he was always always out for our people. Okay, and that's what I see of, of you guys today.